He was a morbidly obese surgeon destined for an operating table and an early death. Now he's a rebel MD who is fabulously fit and fighting to make America healthy again. This is Stay Off My Operating Table with Dr. Philip Ovedia. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast, and we have something happening today which Phil doesn't know has never happened before, and that is we're interviewing someone that I have unsuccessfully stalked. I know literally nothing about this guy. <laughs> so, Phil, set the table for me, man. Well, that's probably maybe apropos because very excited to have uh, Doug Reynolds on today. And Doug has, I describe it as been at the forefront behind the scenes. And maybe a lot of people don't know who he is, but we all really should know who he is in the metabolic health space because he's been doing some amazing things to spread this message, help bring this message uh, forward. And we're going to talk about all of that. But uh, with that in mind, Doug, one of the things we always like to get is sort of the story uh, behind all the people we bring on and how you came to metabolic health and uh, where, how that's led you to what you're doing today. Hey, Phil. Well, yeah, thanks a lot for having me on. And I, I don't know whether it's a good thing to know that I'm not easily stalkable. Well, the, <laughs> the real what happened was, I don't want it to, to spoil the punchline, but I typed in the wrong URL. I typed in lowcarbusa.com, which, yeah. by the way, is for sale. They tried to send it to me, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was last night, and I was busy doing other things, and I just said, hmm, I can't find out anything about him, so we'll do that all together right now. <laughs> all right, well, when I start telling this story, it normally gets out of control, and it's a long story, so I'm, I'm trying like a pricey of it. Basically, I was a runner, a distance runner, not an elite guy, but sort of finishing in the top 100 of a race with 14,000 participants or something. So mm. I was doing pretty well. I was still an hour and a half behind the, the winner, but still way ahead of, of most of the other people. And I just started putting on a little bit of weight. Back in my 30s, I was fine, but I'm in my later 40s and stuff. I was couple of pounds each year that I thought I was just being lazy and not running enough and whatever. My knees were getting sore. I was having respiratory problems and I was just kind of miserable. And at, at that time, someone actually sent me an email trying to sell me exogenous ketones. And I had never even heard of a ketone before. I didn't know what it was. And so the email said, ketones an alternative source of energy to glucose and so i just started investigating it spent about three weeks and just got dived deep into this concept of ketosis and all of that kind of stuff and it kind of started to make sense to me that all these issues that i was starting to struggle with now and all the issues that i had when i was a distance runner back in my 30s could all be described by carbohydrate poisoning almost you know what I mean I would get really 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 fit for these races and follow Tim Noakes's carb loading regimen for the three days before and literally be standing on the start line thinking oh my god I don't even feel like I can run to the corner let alone 55 miles up that mountain and I always thought it was nerves because I put all my eggs in one basket like every year I spent the entire year preparing for this big race and it was like, okay, I'm just way nervous about this. Now I've come to understand that wasn't the case. So anyway. I'm... You're going to close that loop for us, right? In, in what sense? <clears throat> that you understood that wasn't the case. It was, in fact, something else. Uh, it, You're going it, to it, tell us what it was, right? Well, it was, in okay. fact, as I mentioned a bit earlier, it was the fact that the carbohydrates were poisoning me in a sense that my whole system was because I was South African we eat a lot of meat and whatever and then, yeah I was, I was eating pastas and that kind of stuff but not excessively and then when it just took all the protein out and just ate carbohydrates for three days it just my body basically shut down 
And I understand that now. I didn't obviously understand it at the time. I just thought I was being crippled by nerves. So the company that was selling the exogenous ketones was brand new and they'd already run out and I, they weren't even available to buy even if I'd wanted to. But I'd learned so much about it and I thought to myself, why don't I just do this via the diet? Because it seems like it would be much more effective anyway. So we went shopping and bought some ribeye steaks instead of this really lean stuff that I always used to buy and full cream yogurt and heavy cream and went home and, and started trying to do this back in 2015. And there was very little help back then about how to actually do this. And so just learn by trial and error. You know? and over about a five month period, my weight, I was about 35 pounds over what I used to consider my fighting weight. And I got back down to 160 within that five and a half months. My knees cleared up, my respiratory issues cleared up. I, we used to do back-to-back -back martial arts classes twice a week. And normally before I started doing this, I would barely be able to get out of bed in the morning. Um, and now I was bouncing out of bed and going for a run. And I just couldn't understand why I was at the age of that. In fact, it was my birthday when I actually turned 52. And I was, I was like pounding my fist saying like, how did I know this? Or how didn't I know this? I, I knew how to put on, that was one of the things that I did in the previous job that I had, but you knew how to put on big conferences. So why not use that skill to be able to help other people understand and learn about the stuff that I didn't know about until I was over 50? And that was the, the first thing. I spoke to a couple of people trying to find out. I'd, I'd never been to a low-carb conference or anything. I didn't have any idea. I didn't know any of the, of the players. I wrote to a few people like just looking them up on their web, websites. And Gary Taubes was actually the one that eventually asked me if he could speak to me on the phone. And I was aware of how much he charged for his time and everything. And I was like, I was really nervous about it. And I tease him. And when I introduce him onto the stage, I tease him and say, like, it was like I'd asked to marry his daughter or something. It was like this big inquisition. But it was really just trying to find out whether he was going to be confident that I was going to be able to put this on. Because he didn't want to come and take the time and show up and have five people in the room, you know. And at the end of it, he said, okay, well, if you put this on, I'll come and speak. And I put down the phone and Pam was standing down the corridor, like listening. I was on speakerphone and I looked at her and I just said, like, shit, like, this is real now, you know? <laughs> now we um, got to do it. Yeah, I better. we had no website. We had no so social media presence at, at all. And you were a guy with an idea at this point as well. It, it was totally. I mean, we were, yeah, now, by now it's like the beginning of February. And... So we started putting this whole thing together, found a friend of ours to help us build a website where they wouldn't actually charge us to do it. And it was such a crap website, but it did the job. It, it All it did was say, like, think, okay, some pictures of some people that were going to speak and a link to go and buy a ticket. And then that, that was about the sum total of the, of the website. But I didn't put a thousand people in the room, but we got about 350, which was way bigger than anybody we put it on in July. It was like six months later. So people had to convert, like talk me down a bit and say, like, you understand that what you did in six months was pretty amazing. And I obviously now, in retrospect, come to accept that. But in the beginning, I was kind of upset that I didn't realize how difficult it was to put a thousand people in the room. It's It's way tougher than people think. And so, but people were saying, like, what about next year? And you need to come to the East Coast and all of these different things. And we had only intended to put on one event. But, uh, I stayed up all night. I built a web page for the next year's event. And uh, look, hey, I'll sell you the tickets way cheap if you commit to coming now. And it helped me. I, I, because I didn't put a thousand people in the room and the, the, the things that I committed to with the hotel, I was like, an, an enormous amount of money underwater and I, we didn't even know how we were going to get out of the hotel and the, these people we had about 84 people bought tickets for the next year like within that week that i gave them like immediately after the event and that literally helped us 
pay the hotel bills and get out of jail. And so now the next one was planned. Then we ended up doing one in Florida in the January at, at uh, West Palm Beach. For a couple of years, it was at West Palm Beach. And the one that we just did in San Diego now in August was the 19th conference that we've done. And the one in Boca coming up in January will be, will be obviously the 20th one. And that's quite a milestone, I think, and from starting out thinking, wow, okay, let's just do one conference. So anyway, yeah, I mean, that's the short version of the story. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, it's just so amazing to see how these conferences has grown. I mean, it was really one of my shortly after kind of I had been introduced to low carb and did it personally and then was thinking about integrating it into my professional life somehow, attending one of the Boca conferences a few years back was really my first experience with the community and now seeing how it's grown over the years and just continues to grow has really been impressive. And one of the things I say about the meetings is they really are the best medical meetings I go to anymore because obviously I'd spent the first half of my career going to the usual meetings in my specialty. Mm -hmm. And it ends up being a lot of, um, although these are scientific meetings or where breakthroughs are supposed to be talked about, the reality is that it ends up being a lot of the same stuff and a lot of the same industry influences. And there are so many issues with medical conferences these days, but Low Carb USA and the meetings that, that you've been putting on have been so different and so refreshing. And I hear that from all the other practitioners that attend. So I, I guess, what do you think is so unique about these that has allowed it to grow and has gained interest, not only from the practitioners, but one other thing to point out about these meetings is people interested in low carb, non-practitioners come to the meetings as well, which is another very unique feature. I think a reason for that a lot of the time is that people have had to learn about it themselves in order to be able to do it. They've heard about it and they wanted to try it, but their doctors won't support them and won't help them and teach them about it. So they've had to go and learn about it themselves. And so a lot of the times, I mean, there's a lot of people that come to these meetings that are just uh, regular people in, from the public that know more about the science behind this than most doctors, I'm prepared to say, in this country. In fact, around the world, not even just in this country. Just because they didn't do medicine doesn't mean they're not bright people and that they can't read a, a paper and understand it. And assimilate that that information and so there's a lot of people out there that are very well educated about this that are not doctors and not medical practitioners and so they come and they listen to i mean we have cme credits for all our talks at these events and so obviously there's a standard that we set in terms of the science and the evidence that that needs to be presented as part of the talk and these regular non-practitioner type people are sitting there and learning about it just as much as anybody else and it's an amazing thing to see but and you asked the question phil about what's so different about it and I, I don't it's the the vibe and the atmosphere i think that we try to cultivate we had one of the ladies that, that attended in, in san diego she also did a poster presentation and she says she's attended like she said like about a, hundreds of conferences and she said to pam like this is by far the best conference I've ever been to. And we didn't do anything on purpose. It just, uh, but I think from the second one that we did in West Palm Beach, um, for the first time, I wasn't running around like a chicken without a head, trying to keep everything on the rails. It was a smaller event and I was also able, able to look up and kind of see what was going on and hear what was going on and hear about how excited people were about being there and having one of the girls come and talk to Pam and saying, I don't think I should be here. Like I'm a health coach, but look at me. She was like overweight and everything. She's saying, you know, I shouldn't be, how can I even speak to people about the right diet? But I'm trying to do this and it's helping me. And I just thought that this might be useful for me. And Pam said, yeah, please just stay and just see what you can learn here. And, and 
watching her over those three days just develop was incredible because now she could speak to doctors and friends and whatever that didn't chastise her for and telling her that she's going to kill herself and all of that kind of stuff. <laughs> and it, it made us aware of the fact that, or well, made me aware of the fact that what people needed more than anything because of this resistance from the majority of practitioners, what people need is support and a place to be, to feel like they're safe. And after a while, I started to become aware of the fact that it was even more important for the practitioners to have something like that. So for the doctors and the dietitians and the and other people in this medical space that are trying to do this, they are in the wilderness still. I think there's more of them now than there used to be 10 years ago, but they still ostracized and they get bullied by their peers at the, at the universities. They get bullied by the people in their local organizations that they or medical professional organizations that they belong to. They just find it very lonely to practice like that. So now if we find an, a place to bring everybody together where no one is judging them and everyone is actually totally on board with what they're trying to do with their patients, that's something that they really needed. And I think hopefully we get to talk about that as well. But I mean, that's how we eventually got to a point where we realized that a professional organization for all of these people to belong to was very important. And that's kind of the, the second part of this, of my story, really. Bill, I'd like to ask you about what Doug said about the abuse or, or disrespect anyway, that medical practitioners who are advocating for this kind of low carb lifestyle. I mean, can I ask you about that? Oh, certainly. Yeah. And it's a very real problem for the practitioners who saw the amazing results that these approaches can have and then wanted to go out and do it for their patients, bring it to their patients. But quite frankly, we're afraid to do so. We're intimidated. There have been two very public cases about doctors being literally put on trial for doing this. Tim Noakes and Gary Fetke in South Africa and Tasmania both had their medical license basically revoked and they had to fight back, fight for them in court. Both were exonerated because this approach is supported by the science, is supported by the literature, and perhaps emblematic of larger issues in society. We know today that what's put forth oftentimes as fact, as dogma, and I've certainly mentioned many of the things that I was told were truth in medical school and beyond that I've now come to discover that there's lots of scientific evidence going against these things. But without a organization behind you as a practitioner, you are kind of going out on a limb. So this was a very big issue. And as I started doing this and talking to my fellow practitioners at these meetings, and many of them said to me, we know this works. We just can't tell our patients about it because of that oh, re repercussions. And so that I think, because you can't blame, I can't blame a practitioner for ignorance. And, and I don't say that in a negative way. Right. I was ignorant about these things before I knew about them because they're not taught, they're not promoted in any way. And so I just didn't know. But once I knew not taking it to my patients. That's just something I, I couldn't live with. But unfortunately, many practitioners are so trapped within the system, so had such fears about repercussions that they just couldn't do it. They couldn't risk their careers on this. Thankfully, I think this is less of an issue today because of the work that Doug has been doing, establishing. So we now have a professional organization, the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, there's a path to certification for professionals to, and there are white papers and there are, we now have a textbook on ketogenic nutritional therapy from the nutrition network, which is kind of a sister wow. international organization. And so now 
I know I'm quite confident and I know a lot more of my fellow practitioners are confident that if, if we were to get challenged on this, it is defensible because it is. <laughs> I mean, there is enough scientific evidence and now we have the resources to back us up. But I think that was so important. And again, I think that's such an important part of what Doug has been able to do because it was one thing to put on the conferences, uh, but then bringing together all of that he has to establish the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners and give us that professional organization. Maybe Doug can kind of talk about some of the challenges that go into that, because that's yeah. definitely not an easy thing to do. This sounds like there'd be quite a story there, Doug. Yeah. But just to go back quickly to what uh, Phil was saying there about, that's what started this whole thing was the Dell Height was mediating a session that we did with Gary Taos back in 2000, getting feedback from practitioners that were that were trying to do this in their practice. But it, what evolved from that was her vision about what we really needed. And what she was saying was that we need standard of care around carbohydrate reduction, therapeutic carbohydrate reduction, and not necessarily saying they're wrong, we're right, whatever, but just saying there's an alternative. If you don't consume carbohydrates, then our metabolisms are different. And so therefore different things should apply. And one of the things that she brought up when we first started talking about it was when she was on a, a jury for a, mal a medical malpractice lawsuit. And the judge had to explain to the jury what standard of care was. And the legal definition, at least in the US of standard of care is that it is defined by providing healthcare in accordance with the standards of practice among members of the same healthcare profession with similar training and experience and is situated in the same or similar communities at the time the healthcare is rendered. In other words, standard of care does not come from what is taught from in professional training, from public health policy, or even from clinical care guidelines, although these can inform and help define the standard of care. Rather, standard of care comes from what a community of clinicians do in the actual provision of care. And so it's not a document, it's a consensus. It's a matter of opinion amongst, you have to poll a bunch of people in the same environment. And so her idea was, first of all, to create this, a, a guidelines document, medical guidelines document to start the conversation and then build a discussion around these things and build a community around this document where there was a consensus amongst all of those people with now with the same training in the same environment, doing the same thing. Now we are starting to establish standard of care for therapeutic carbohydrate reduction. And when we first published the, the, the guidelines document, we published it on Low Carb USA because nothing else existed at the time. But in the beginning of 2020, we started realizing that we some, we needed a, a professional organization for, for these practitioners to belong to. And so it was just after we started talking about this that COVID hit. And so right through all through the 2020 during while we were, everyone was at home with COVID, I basically built this nonprofit called the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners to be this professional organization. And as Phil said, we defined different accreditation pathways. We have grand rounds talks that we do once a month. And it's a real professional organization now that exists. And now the, the provider database that we have for people to find doctors that are sympathetic to this thing, the clinical guidelines have migrated over there and they have a real home now. And yeah, it, this, this whole thing, we basically launched it in December of 2020. And it was one of those things I've built so many businesses or tried to build so many businesses and stuff through my years when I believed it was a brilliant idea and I spent so much time building it and you put it out there and no one else thought it was a good idea. <laughs> I was the only one, right? Um, and so it was even with this, like I had a, a board of directors for this organization, but we still didn't know how it was going to come across, how it was going to be accepted. And we put it out there and it, people just came flocking and we, our membership 
of December and January, rocketed up. And obviously the accreditation process is, is, takes some time. So it took a while for the first people to start getting accredited. But I mean, it's only been going a year and a bit. And so since the first person got accredited and uh, a couple of days ago, this the 70th person to be accredited is now fully accredited. They can use SMHP behind their name. It was metabolic health, no, they can use MHP, metabolic health practitioner behind their name. And it just made us realize that for once, I thought something was a good idea and everybody else thought it was a good <laughs> idea too, which is pretty cool. I think if, if I had to have a choice now in retrospect, if there was be one thing that, that would work and nothing else, I'd absolutely choose this one because it's making such a difference. Just the other day, I mean, it's actually quite a while back now, but I tell the story and I've told that story a number of times, but one of the doctors that, that got accredited a little while back, I sent her the thing saying, okay, the review board's taken a look at it and we're pleased to say that your application for accreditation has been accepted. And she wrote back to us and she said, this means more to me than when I became MD. She wow. said, I, because now I feel like for the very first time I can actually help people. And that, I, I, we need to put that up as a, as a slogan, like on the, the homepage of our website, because I think that's what, it, that's what it's all about. That's what we were hoping that this would be, but we didn't know until we actually put it out there. And the fact that people are responding, there are so many people kind of in the process somewhere along the line of trying to get accredited now. We had a table, an SMHP table at the Denver low carb conference back in March. And um, so many people were coming to the table and like they saw SMHP and they came up and said, we're working on our accreditation. We've only got one more course to go. And the CMEs from this event are going to give us our required allotment and I'll be able to apply kind of next month to be accredited. And they were so excited about it. And I was like, okay, like, I feel like we're doing something good. Yeah which has been cool. As a non-healthcare professional, I'm just a guy who needed help. And I was very aware of how outside the boundaries of accepted practice hmm. this was. I was very fortunate to have stumbled into a naturopath who supported me in this regard. And I've just kind of accepted as, it's just the way things are that most physicians just don't know and or and or don't care. And that's just us Joe Blows like me just got to fight our way through alone. And it's fun when we find each other and can support each other. It never occurred to me how hellish it must be to be a medical practitioner and be alone in this. Mm. So holy, Bob, you've opened my eyes to a whole new set of problems that has a solution, I guess, which is really cool. Mm. It's really exciting. So at these at these conventions, the low carb USA conventions, are there paths for non-medical practitioners and different paths for medical practitioners? I mean, you mean if somebody you mean like within me, the, you mean within the conference itself? Yeah. So we've thought about it a few times and in the end we we haven't ever done that and as i mentioned to you sometimes if the people come in as total newbies they're just starting to get involved with low carb and then they see low carb usa and they buy a ticket and they come sometimes a, a lot of the talks will go like over their head a bit but like I, I think a lot of the stuff that i read about i'm i'm just an engineer as well right so when i first started reading some of these medical papers and stuff like that it was like I struggled to understand what they were talking about. But I sat there with a dictionary and literally, well, not with it, I had a dictionary up, you know, Google. But it, it, that was how I learned. I, I read it and I didn't understand something and I would start trying to understand the, what the words meant and these different terms and phrases and whatever. And slowly but surely, we start to to pick it up and, and start to learn about it. And, and so these newbies that we just talk to them and say, listen, just listen. A lot of it you will still understand. And the stuff that, that you, you just can't compute, just let it go. 
And you'll hear it a couple of times, maybe through the event over the next couple of years. And as every time you listen to a lecture again, or you hear him talk about it again, you, you start to, you've, you've assimilated so much knowledge that now stuff starts to make sense. And over time, that stuff will make sense to you. And as I mentioned earlier in this interview, like we have people that are non-medical pra practitioners, a lot of you even that attend these events that that fully understand what's being taught. And that's mainly because they've taken the time to go and learn about it themselves. And again, most likely most of the time is because their doctors wouldn't help them. And the only way they could help themselves would be to learn about it themselves so that they, because they also don't want to do something stupid and, and, right. and hurt themselves. <laughs> so you go and learn about it exactly. and then and then do it yourself. And as much as we absolutely don't advocate this, there are people that have taken themselves off their medications because their doctors wouldn't do it. Yeah. And they were so determined to do this that they went and learned about it and, and they did it. But now that there's more and more people, we've got our medical provider list on the SMHP site and there are ways to get, like Phil here is licensed in every single state pretty much. So there are people that you, medical professionals that you can approach to say, I want to do this. My doctor, my state, whatever, my city won't help me. Please help me with the medications because I'm for more than anything else. I feel like that's the most important thing. And Phil will attest to this, that when you cut carbs out of your life, your metabolism changes so fast that if you don't know what you're doing with your medications, you can get into big trouble really quickly and it's really important that you have somebody a medical professional you have to find someone that knows about this you can't go to as people are finding out you can't go to your regular doctor and they're not on board with our car they are going to tell you not to do this or you'll die you're going to have a heart attack you're going to kill yourself kidneys this and that and all whatever the horror stories that they try and talk about so fire that guy or that lady or that that doctor and find somebody and most of the time you might and these days you might still have to find someone virtual online but find somebody who has the qualifications to to help you with your medications pretty much help you titrate and get you in a lot of cases get you off your medications completely because that is, it happened, like I said, it happened so fast and it's important that you manage it properly. So what I'm hearing here for, I'm looking at this from the standpoint of a guy who is not a medical professional. Phil and I have been doing this podcast now for over two years and I've gotten to sit and listen and learn from a hundred different medical professionals who have all embraced some aspect of this. It sounds to me like three or four days at low carb USA would expose me to the same quality and almost quantity of education that I've received over two years. I would agree with that. I see Phil nodding his head. I, I think that's very true. I think the quality of our, if I look back at, at, at what our lineup looked like in that very first conference we did in 2016, we had some really good speakers, but we had some kind of okay, <laughs> iffy speakers. But like it, we, it gets better and better. There's more and more people that are prepared to work with me. I mean, we're still a grassroots organization and we still struggle to pay our bills. And so I, I talk with these sometimes very well-known, famous people and, and we discuss what it's going to take to to get them to come and, and be a part of it. And so many of them just come and do it for nothing because they're just so keen for me to continue to be able to do this and get this message wow. out there for them and so yeah i mean we've, we're getting better each time we're getting more help uh, rod taylor from low carb down under has been helping me be able to pay for the flights for some international speakers to come out and stuff like that just so that we can keep continuing to improve on the quality of the lineup that we have at our events 
Yeah. I mean, I'll give my perspective. I speak at the events, but I look more forward to listening at the events. And I learn so much from the other speakers. And I learn so much from that interaction with the audience, with the non-practitioners, because one of the things that I have found as I went through this whole journey and my own personal and professional development around this is the perspective of the non-medical professionals has really been so enlightening in many cases because they don't come with the same blind spots, the same biases that were sort of programmed into me, I guess you could say, or that I just had. And it's not unusual that someone will kind of bring up a point. Yeah, I can read all the scientific articles, but in a lot of ways, some of the things that some of the underlying assumptions that I have that other people don't have allows them to look at that in a different way and really bring a different light to some of these things. So that, like I said, is a great part of these conferences and not separating the practitioners from the non-practitioners is certainly, I think, one of the best parts of this. That um, does sound pretty cool. That really does sound cool. And I think that's, yes, if you can't do it any other way, then the live stream is second best. But if you can be there in person, I'm hoping it's part of the, the culture that we're trying to, to cultivate has got something to do with it. But the vibe over the three or four days of the event is just incredible. The excitement and the discussions in the hallways and in the expo and the, the wine tasting and the dinner. We've always put on like really good work with the chef of the hotel to put on really good low carb dinners. Oh, that so all by itself would be fun. It, it, it's just amazing. Look, a place where you're not having to we wade through the menu to find something that yeah no you can literally go there and take anything off the table and you know that it's that it's good and we make sure that we keep everything like kind of what we like at ketogenic cut levels so we don't allow any vegetables or anything that are not really really low in carbohydrates so that people don't don't have to be concerned about what they take off that table and we even in san diego we even have like what we call a carnivore option where they get a big freaking steak on their plate on top of everything else and yeah, it's a. Uh, it, it's just the, the the conversations that you manage to have, and the what what's always turned the, the speakers are always so available, and let's go and sit at a table where there's not anybody else, and just like sit down and say, "Hi, do you mind if I sit here?" And then everybody's like, "Well, yeah, no, of course you can sit here." But like by the end of the day, or by the end of that dinner, they all good friends. They changing swapping numbers and there's so many people that make amazing friends at, at these things we had a, a two girls that ladies and say girls but who met back in 2017 2018 in san diego and they live in completely different states and they they basically come to all our events so that they can hang out with each other they can see each other absolutely the best friends since they met there and it's just in incredible to to see how many of those sorts of situations come out of it and then and i always say my kind of closing talk at the end of the conference that i feel like i'm not a medical pra practitioner I, I, I make this so that there's a platform for people like phil to get up there and teach people about it but at the end of the day, what I'm hoping I also bring to the table is cultivating inspiration that yeah. through this experience of being there for three or four days, that they go home totally inspired to do this in their practice, or if they're already doing it, to do it better, to find ways to be more efficient, to see more patients, to apply what they've learned now to help them better and to be better themselves. If they go home with that intent, then, then I feel like I've done my job at putting this thing on. I'm looking at the P website and it's talking about the use of carbohydrate reduction in addressing and even reversing. And then it lists all these conditions. Type 2 diabetes, yeah, I've heard a lot about that. We have a lot of folks talk about that. Fatty liver disease, PCOS, 
uh, cardiovascular disease, epilepsy, traumatic brain injuries, Alzheimer's, neurological pathologies, mental health. It sounds like almost any kind of health practitioner would benefit from this, not just peas. And then I'm guessing nutritionists and dietitians and fitness mental trainers. Health. And I could, at yeah, least, yeah, fitness trainers is a big one as well. Um, like since January, we, we had a, a special in Boca, we had a special focus day on food addiction because that's becoming more and more apparent. There's a hard, why, how, when people struggle to stay on board with this, it's, because they are very badly addicted to carbohydrates. And I've had to be become more tolerant of the fact that, that this is a real thing because I've become aware of the fact that I obviously wasn't addicted. And so for me, it was like this, it was like easy. And so when other people tell me, oh, it's so hard. It's like, I didn't have any tolerance for that because it was like rubbish. It's not difficult at all. So anyway, we felt like we needed to focus on that, but like, in August now, we had a big focus day on cancer. We've started to now have a day where we focus on a particular condition. In January in Boca, we, we're focusing on type 1 diabetes, uh, which is very different to type 2 in, in, in the management and, and, and just in, its, in, in, in and of itself. August next year in, in San Diego, we're focusing on mental health. And so, as you said, it's just like, it, it's almost like every day we hear about another condition or another thing that where this can at least help, if not help totally reverse it, it can at least help make the symptoms better or make life easier or, or whatever. But just, I, I don't know if you don't mind me telling another story. I mean, yeah. um, talking about mental health, uh, Chris Palmer and you, you, you might have even been there, Phil, in, in Boca. Chris Palmer did a talk. Mm -hmm. And right sort of at the end, he told the story about a patient where they had severe schizophrenia. And he painted the picture of, of what this person's life was like living with this. And then talked about working with him to change the way that he eat, ate and change his lifestyle and has now at a point where he lives a normal life med med medication free hmm. and that was kind of how he ended his talk and you could have heard a pin drop in there it was like everybody had a tear in their eye or a lump in their throat. I got up there to try and kick off the Q and A session, and I couldn't speak because of this exactly that. And it makes you realize the power of this for just so many different things that impact people's lives. Like, I mean, I lost a bit of weight, and my knees stopped hurting, and I could run more. But that's like nothing compared to that guy's how it changed that guy's life. You know, and there's just thousands, hundreds of thousands of stories like that make me realize how important this is, what we're doing, how important it is. Yeah, it's just, again, what gives me hope is seeing this growth, going to the conferences, seeing the changes, seeing how many more practitioners and non-practitioners and all the different specialties now that the practitioners come from. Uh, and it really... As we know, this is root cause. This is at the basis of all of our health. And one of the things, again, that's so great and so unique is these different specialties coming together because largely mm -hmm. the practice of medicine separates specialties and the cardiac guys don't really interact much with the neuro guys and the psychiatric guys. And this gives us a chance to all come together because we realize that we're tackling the same problem from different symptoms, but it's the same problem. And, and again, one of the powerful things about this, we didn't even really get to touch on the scale that this is growing at. And you and I are both actually imminently leaving for international travel because this is happening on a global scale and right. we're tackling that as well. So very, very exciting. So let's give the details of the upcoming conference here in the U.S., let people know how they can attend, how they can see 
all of these great things that we've been talking about. And like you said, come be a part of it because that is the most powerful, I think the most powerful action that any of us can take is come be a part of it. Yeah, come and be a part of it. We understand if you absolutely can't, but if there's any way that you can make a plan to be there, you won't be sorry. Uh, I can promise you that. So yeah, I mean, Low Carb USA, one word, lowcarbusa.org, not .com, but just search Low Carb USA and Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, the website itself, it's all Low Carb USA. And so on the website, you go and hover, scroll down a bit and there's like a big picture there about this poker event that you can just click on and go there directly. Or you go to the menu and hover over events and there'll be a drop down and you can select whichever event you're interested in looking at. The next one coming up is obviously poker in January. Um, and yeah, I mean, there you can learn about all the different people that like Phil that are going to be speaking there. And then if you decide you want to go, then there's a way to purchase tickets and in-person or live stream, both options. And uh, yeah, okay. even if you, you, you attend on the live stream, we're doing a better job with that as well. Pam sits at the back, like the whole way through the conference now, and she's just amazing just talking with people and stuff. And so they sit on the chat basically and, and have these conversations for four days. That's just pretty incredible. So that you do get something out of it outside of just listening to the talks by watching it live, because then you can participate in the discussions and that you can, we have a mechanism now where the, the, the online people can submit questions as well that we can put to the, to the speakers during the Q&A. And so, yeah, a live stream is still good, but yep. All right. we've said it a couple of times, if you can make it in person, just do it. And just to reinforce for the practitioners listening and watching this, that you can get CME credits. Uh, on the website, you can also, uh, you have the back catalogs of the previous meetings that you can purchase those recordings and get CME credits for some of those as well. And then for any practitioners out there, again, I strongly encourage, come look at the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, mm. and we'll have that link as well. Come join us and come get the support of the community. Yeah, come and be a part of it. Anybody can can put their contact information in there for free but if they want to then get accredited and attend the grand rounds and participate in the community then they need to to join and become members but everybody that i know that that's done it totally feels like it's worthwhile and um the the fact that so many people are in the pipeline of trying to get accredited proves to us that's an important piece as well so yeah come and be a part of it all right. And there's a way even to join as as a non-practitioner member, it's cheaper. So if they, they, then you can still attend the Grand Rounds talks and participate in any forum discussions, um, but you just can't be accredited if you're a non-practitioner member. But you can at least just come and listen to people like Phil give a, a, a Grand Rounds talk there as well. And those always turn out to be, like I have to be really strict Phil will know about this, like during the Q and A's to try and get everybody to get a chance to ask their question in a short space of time. With the grand rounds, there's no cap on it. So the cap really is as long as the speaker's prepared to, to sit there and, and, and stay there. We've run three hours. Amy Berger did a talk that was, the talk itself was about 50 minutes. And we ran way over three hours total with all the the questions and the discussions and the conversations that came out of her talk. And Phil was talking about, he often enjoys that part of it as well as those interactions with those attendees, because the questions that come out often have come up with what the person has spoken about. And there's so many others that didn't get that piece or we needed something clarified or, or whatever that, that makes the value of what you learn, take away from that session so much better if the people have had a chance to interact with the speakers and ask them to clarify stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So that's lowcarbusa.org and the smhp.org. Correct. The so we've got, we have the .com for that as well, but it just points to the 
to the dot org site. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll make sure that uh, all those links are in the show notes. Any closing words, Phil? Just hope to see as many people as possible in January in Boca. Depending on where you live, it's probably going to be an improvement in weather, if nothing else. <laughs> and it will also be it, it just such an amazing experience. Like I said, having been to many now as both an attendee and a speaker, it really is my favorite thing to do every year is to get to the conference. So I look forward to seeing people there. That's and brilliant. thank you, Doug, for you know, read, all the work just, you've done. Uh, it's all worthwhile when I see that how many people it's helping, I must say. Did we, I, I don't know, I may have spaced it. Did you mention the, the code, the, the discount code? Uh, oh, we did not talk about so that. So yeah, so there's a discount code for 20%. It's October 1st through this month. And it's October 1st spelled with a K, like they spell it in Germany. But uh, yeah, 20% off October 1st. And it says that when you actually go and register, it, it's there as well, but just so that you know, it's 20% off. And if you want to purchase the CME certificates, then it's a, it applies to that as well. So it's 20% off your cart, basically. All right. If, if, well, uh, we'll definitely make sure that shows up in the show notes as well. Okay. So very good. All right, guys. Thanks so much. I've heard of Low Carb USA, but I had no idea really what it was. And I'm pretty stoked now. All right. Well, for Doug Reynolds of Low Carb USA and Dr. Philip Ovedia, this has been the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast, and we will talk to y'all next time. Chances are you wouldn't be listening to this podcast if you didn't need to change your life and get healthier. So take action right now. Book a call with Dr. Ovedia's team. One small step in the right direction is all it takes to get started. Contact us at ifixhearts.com slash talk. That's ifixhearts.com slash talk.